Thanks so much, Magda. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. So Sharon Lavery is a senior lecturer in the Department of English at the University of Pretoria and co-director of the Oceanic Humanities for the Global South Project, which is at oceanichumanities.com. And that's based at Wiser, the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. So welcome, Sharon. Thank you so much. The floor is now yours. Thank you, um, and it's really nice to be here. I've, I've, I've been an, a, a, a participant in a number of these sessions, so it's, it's great to be part of the conversation more broadly. Um, I'm going to share my screen so that we can, I, it's really just, um, I, I mean, I do English literature, so instead of just having words on the screen, I like to add some images so that we have something to work with. Um, uh, I guess as we all do. So, so firstly, thank you very much. It's really great and exciting to be here and be part of this um, seminar with uh, a really important overall topic um, and particularly to, to be part of this theme and to kind of recognize that it is a bit of a theme, um, uh, uh, water epistemologies and, and uh, critical ocean studies. Um, so I guess the... Um, uh firstly to just situate us a little bit and um remind me i think i have about 30 minutes to speak um i'll, I'll stop when i get to that yeah that's fine yeah cool um so i i thought i would uh, i i wasn't quite sure whether i should go very broad or very um uh, a little bit more narrow to start with something concrete and then and move out to the wider project so i started i decided on the latter um, I'm speaking to a paper that recently appeared in the inaugural issue of a new journal called Global 19th Century Studies. But I thought it would also be nice to situate it within the, within the context of our research project, which, um, as Kim Menson mentioned, is based at Wiser at WITS um, in Johannesburg, and it's, it's called the Oceanic Humanities for the Global South, and you can see the link on the screen. Um, We've sort of come to a, a five-year uh, reflection point in the project, and um, my co-director Isabel Hoffmeyer has recently said that um, you know the, the the frame of the project, the Oceanic Humanities for the Global South, has um, through the work being done on the project by its participants and researchers, just sort of been shifting from this awareness that you know the humanities needs to address the ocean in a time of rising seas. Um, and also that critical ocean studies is very northern based and needs a little bit of um, decolonizing energy. Um, but it's shifted from that, uh, you know, oceanic humanities for the global south to a conception of the global south as oceanic. Um, I, I, I provided the paper to circulate before on the oceanic south um, because it, it sort of sums up that turning point in our in our thinking or uh, it's kind of concentration of our thinking. It was written with my colleague um, Meg Samuelson based at the University of Adelaide. Um, and it's a project that's been pursued by us in quite different ways since then. Um, Meg, who I think uh, is scheduled to um, talk to you later in the year, and so you'll see this, um, she's interested in the ways in which we might think of the Southern Hemisphere as blue, like a blue planet, but a blue Southern Hemisphere. And, and it's linked to the blues, both a kind of um, melancholic mode and, and the music genre. But also she's been working on the ways in which that blueness speaks to um, a, a land water connectedness that she describes as amphibious and which um, uh, impacts also and can be understood through literary form, so amphibious literary form. So, I've been interested in the ways that um, the, the Southern Ocean um, can really materialize these rather abstract kinds of thinking um, and the ways in which it's central to the, to the challenge of thinking both oceanically and from the South. Um, so, and I, I, I've been working, kind of playing with the idea of, you know, we, we used to, um, we, we're used to the calls for theory from the South. And what if, what if we were to shift that and think of it differently to theory from the Southern Ocean? Um, or thinking from the Southern Ocean. Um, and and it's, it's partly playful and partly helping um, me, I think, to rather concretize the very difficult problem of thinking about environmental crisis without losing 
um, a focus on histories of colonization, on social justice and on racial justice. So how to think those two major problems together, even though they seem to operate on different timescales. Um, so my work, and so I'm, bring, I'm, get, I'm getting uh, from the introduction to the focus of this paper, my work has been on um, literatures of the Indian Ocean. So that's been where my focus has been. Um, my book on this appeared uh, right at the end of last year. Um, and so what I wanted to do was to bring this work on the Indian Ocean together with my work on the Oceanic South and um, kind of critical oceanic humanities more broadly um, through thinking about the, the Southern and the Indian Ocean together. So the Southern Indian Ocean, it's a much sort of smaller project than either of these two um, projects, but I thought would give us a sense, um, you know, moving from the small to the large. Um, lost my mouse. Okay, so uh, what the, the, the paper, as I'm um, now finally getting to today, is um, it's just going to describe the characteristics of the Southern Indian Ocean as a region, place it within the Oceanic South. So we'll get um, a little bit more uh, detail about the, the reading I shared. Um, and then if there's time, but um, there might not be, we can talk about it in questions, is to look at one example, um, a work of fiction. Um, so the Indian Ocean, I think as many of you will be quite familiar with, has long been a space of South-South connection. So it's being called the cradle of globalization, the ocean of the South. Um, and that all those connections are facilitated by the monsoon that as you can see in the image, goes uh, one way half the year and the other way, um, the other half of the year. Uh, so it's sort of allowed, unlike the, uh, uh, to the same extent, the Atlantic or the Pacific, um, this very sort of regular and intuitive, roughly predictable cross ocean travel, as well as coastal travel, you can get all the way around just by hugging the coastlines. Um, so in the book, I argue that uh, that the Indian Ocean is not only this kind of real space of transnational trade and interconnection, it's very South-South, but um, also that it's been bound up throughout its history with writing. So it's a real as well as an imagined space and a very vividly imagined space. All those things are true. And I became interested while um, finishing the book on, on, on the ways in which um, they also aren't true. Uh, and one of the regions of the Indian Ocean for which they're not as true is its southern reaches. Um, the southern part of the Indian Ocean, you can see it just doesn't even feature in the image on the screen, um, uh, or not really particularly, um, is it's very remote from all human habitation. It's largely, um, you know, the kind of life and everything in it, in the, its diversity is largely submarine. Um, and it's it's centered on what you know we are roughly neglected latitudes. It links Southern Africa, Australia, Antarctica, and the Subantarctic Indian Ocean Islands, Prince Edward, Kerguelen, the Crozets, MacDonald, and Heard Islands. Um, and it's along these very little traveled routes. Despite the sparseness, the Southern Indian Ocean is becoming increasingly important in the 21st century with its Southern hemispheric ports, colder but warming waters, and biodiverse vulnerable islands, both above and below the sea surface. So I want to argue that there may be a need to find ways to describe and narrate um, to story the Southern Indian Ocean as one as one of the less human parts of the planet. Partly, and you know, it's it's not outside of the impact of colonial um, depredations, and it's also very much determining that, for instance, the monsoon, which underpins its south-south connectedness, is changing in a time of climate change. So this region, um, which is partly in, affected by, the monsoon is changing partly because of melting um, fresh water, cold fresh water of the Antarctic continent into the lower reaches of the Southern Ocean, into the Southern Indian Ocean, and up eventually affecting rainfall in India. So these kind of, the, the Southern Indian Ocean is actually determining for post-colonial futures. Um, it's also a, a constituted part of the Oceanic South. It's one part, not not um, not all the whole thing, um, and not necessarily metonymic, but um, but it it sort of grounds us in a particular space. Um, and in that way, what it has, and I, it's kind of want to introduce a term to um, 
to to think about this is the term oceanicity and it's a term um um there we go sorry i just had a, an image of the the southern indian ocean and you can see that kind of how how uh, how vast the region is it's fully um a third uh, laterally um of the region uh, that we don't really think about much at all um very much connected to south africa so my location here um and a large part of it is just completely landless um and as you can see that southern indian ocean is a part of the oceanic south because what we we um, Meg and I were were talking about its its uniqueness, its distinctive characteristic, is its very high oceanicity. And it's this is the term that I wanted to introduce, which is um, adapted from meteorology, and it indicates the degree to which a place is overall subject to the influence of the sea. It's often compared to continentality, um, and that kind of high degree of oceanicity, if you overlay it with uh, what we think of as the um, uh, underdevelopment or post-colonial poverty of the southern hemisphere, which overlaps with the global south. Um, this uh, ocean-dominated nature of the um, southern Indian Ocean is part of this predominance of the ocean in the summer, southern hemisphere more generally. Um, as Meg Samuelson, you know, has pointed out, she was the first to point this out, um, the southern hemisphere has a 20% higher proportion of ocean to land than the northern hemisphere. So it's a really kind of important difference. Uh, um, these factors are, you know, this kind of overlay of economic and high degree of oceanicity of, are, if anything, exaggerated in the southern Indian Ocean, which makes it a good case study. Um, you know, it's surrounded by low GDP countries, Mozambique, Madagascar, Malaysia, et cetera. Um, and so the suggestion is the southern Indian Ocean is both particularly oceanic and particularly southern. So it this region is like a kind of it, it, it's considered as distinct oceanographic region, but it may offer us useful links, connections, and perspectives as an area of inquiry as well. In this case, in the domain of colonial and post-colonial literature, but also more widely. Um, so Lindsay Bremner uh, a while ago pointed out that the region, the Southern Indian Ocean region came into focus in the public imagination through the intense mediation of the search for the MH370, the Lost Malaysian Airlines flight. Um, you know, several themes emerged from that mediation, including an emphasis on like isolation, depth, darkness, and softness. Um, he has a, um, uh, a kind of this just generally blue maps that, uh, that um, evoked a kind of a public lack of awareness and in fact professional lack of awareness of what was happening in the southern Indian Ocean um, and headlines such as this one, the, the secrets of the dark, deep dark southern Indian Ocean. Um, so those kind of sum up the key, key features. Even the subtitle here, the world's most isolated ocean has a long history of making things disappear. And actually that article also pointed to this long history of, of cultural representation of the space um, which is largely kind of colonial novels about poetry, uh, novels and poetry about shipwrecks, castaways, whaling, maritime imperial exploration. So the the, the mediation keyed into um, a kind of a, a cultural awareness that came from those literary texts by you know Herman Melville, Jules Verne, um, but also comes through in post-colonial authors I'm interested in, like Dan Slay, who I might talk about at the end, Yvette Christiansa, the poet, and others. So the Southern Indian Ocean um, is characterized by, you know, isolation and remoteness. Um, this is the Kerguelen Islands are right in the middle, and they are um, actually, they come up at, if you search for the hardest place to get to in the world. Um, there's six days travel by boat from um, the already remote island of Reunion. Um, uh, Verne's The Castaway of the Flag was set in, um, in uh, it's a fictional island called New Switzerland, but it's, it's roughly where the Kerguelen Islands are. Um, those are the uh, our various islands you said, just, just so you can see where the Kerguelen and various other sub-Antarctic islands of the, of the Indian Ocean are and the way in which um, they kind of are really quite a lot further south, you can see, but they're not labeled Reunion and Mauritius. Um, 
so and also you can see that shape while the northern indian ocean is densely populated its um, southern reaches with continental coastlines slipping away to either side is much less so and most of the life in this region and it should be noted is, is very much submarine as i as i pointed out um that life is situated on this vast and mysterious seafloor topography including mid-ocean ridges hydrothermal vents um uh, and sea mounts, which are sea mountains of the seafloor. Um, here we go. That's the that's the burn book, and here's the um, bathymetry of the Indian Ocean. Um, this is maybe increasingly significant because, as Elizabeth Delogri, um, critical ocean studies scholar, has argued, um, our Anthropocene futures are submarine. So the overwhelmingly submarine character of the Indian Ocean can be pictured by thinking of a bathymetric, so this is the one measuring the, um, the, the sea floor, alongside a political map. And it allows us to see the Indian Ocean not just as a blank blue space, but as, as populated and uh, diverse. Bremner, Lindsay Bremner, who was um, theorizing the um, MH370, um, she also proposes this kind of design, using design thinking to propose an alternative map on the Indian Ocean, which is a folded Indian Ocean, um, a folded along the north-south axis, um, along the Maldives archipelago. And it, it, she does this in order to portray the ocean as what she says, to quote, a figure not a void, decontinentalizing territory and denationalizing space. It's, it also fits, I think, very nicely with that bisect, bisecting shape of the, of the submarine mid-ocean ridge. Um, this folded ocean also highlights the connecting lines of latitude, linking Mogadishu and Singapore along the equator, Durban and Perth on the Tropic of Capricorn. So the Tropic of Capricorn actually emerges as a central line of the southern Indian Ocean, framed to the south by the string of subantarctic islands, and to the north by the tropical militarily occupied island of Diego Garcia. Um, and these latitudinal lines highlight climactic continuities, bringing in that material sense of the ocean, oceanographing sense. And they also centralize a much colder Indian Ocean than we think of. Um, so, you know, replace instead of the stereotypical palm trees and coral reefs associated with Indian Ocean tourist brochures, um, which actually, because of my search history, I get a lot of adverts for these, um, you know, come to the Maldives uh, and, and spend your time in a tropical paradise. Um, but this is a, a different kind of Indian Ocean with windy shores, ice-bound islands, um, uh, and temperate or Mediterranean seaside climates. Um, so the material, geographic, and oceanographic qualities of the Southern Indian Ocean are in many ways similar, of course, to those of the South Atlantic and South Pacific. Um, which are all connected to each other by the Southern Ocean. Um, but they, I, I think that they become a little bit more interesting in relation to the scholarly context of Indian Ocean studies and in relation to what I've said are the futures of the Global South. So um, the Northern Indian Ocean often just stands in for the Indian Ocean as a whole. Um, and I think these materialities as well as metaphors of the Southern Indian Ocean complicate the picture in important ways. Um, I mean, just as one example, um, uh, Yvette Christiansa in her poetry, as I mentioned earlier, um, she uses that imagery, you know, the same as Burns of the Castaway, um, situated also um, in the southern, in these kind of southern hemispheric regions, um, and particularly in Imprendora, whose her second collection um, links the South Atlantic and the Southern Indian Ocean, um, a, 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 as well as to um, slave and colonial histories. Okay. So I, I wanna give a sense of this character um, of, this, uh, of this region. So what Lindsay Bremner in that um, work on the MH370 said, is that, you know, just to give a flavor, the waves in this part of the ocean are monstrous, dwarfing the ship sent out to the search. It is whipped up into storms by the bands of low pressure sweeping eastward across it. Powerful undercurrents rung along its surface slopes. The Ant Antarctic circ circumpolar current transporting 130 billion cubic meters of water per second eastwards around the southern part of the planet virtually unobstructed. And the Indian Ocean gyre swirling anti-clockwise up the west coast of Australia. 
molded by little known trenches and mountains on the seafloor, these currents connect deep, cold, abyssal waters with the surface and influenced by differences in speed, temperature, salinity, and pressure, they collide, swirling and eddying and transmitting energy in complicated, turbulent, nonlinear ways. The South um, Pacific has long been recognized as a space of troubled imperial exploration and violent externalization. And more recently, um, the South Atlantic has come into focus, um, for instance, in this um, great book by Kerry Bystrom and Joseph Slaughter. They, they, they're linking it this in a different way, the Global South, Global South Atlantic. Um, they really also do uh, serve as a model for my study, positing the South Atlantic. It's not so much a geographic fact in their work, but um, more of a problem, to quote. They suggest thinking about it as a geopolitical region and a vision, an ideal or aspiration of solidarity and interconnection. Their work responds to the imperative to, to trace the networks that have historically defined the region because they continue to inform its futures. Isabel Hoffmeyer, in her essay in this volume, um, draws on Yvette Christiansen's poetic geographies to foreground the South Atlantic islands of St. Helena and Ascension Island and their connections to the Subantarctic islands that form a string of land masses connecting the South Atlantic, South Pacific and Southern Indian Ocean in a circumpolar ring. Um, okay, so very brief example before we before I close off. Um, this is just one novel that I thought was interesting, and I think, um, I mean, it's actually a very, very long um, work. That's the South Atlantic, just so you can also see its, its C4 features. Um, it's, a, it's a novel um, by Dan Slay um, called Islands. It was originally published in Afrikaans, um, Eilanda, uh, and translated into English by Andre Brink. And it links several important locations of the Southern Indian Ocean. It's a very sweeping work of historical fiction, uh, sweeping in geographic as well as historical terms. So it's set in the 1780s and it documents the Dutch East India Company's um, transmarine and transnational circuits, particularly from the Cape in South Africa to um, its very close neighboring Robben Island and then increasingly further east um, to Madagascar, Mauritius and eventually Indonesia, Batavia. While the VOC is based in and motivated from Western Europe, the novel fleshes out the Southern Indian Ocean world that the company's interests rely on and create. Um, so right at the end of the novel is the sort of final narrator, there's seven narrators, um, but there's one narrator, there's seven characters and sections. Um, there's a, uh, the final narrator is the scholarly de Grevenbroek, who is attempting a history of the early years of Dutch settlement from nearby Stellenbosch. And he says, the key to the Dutch economy was the company. The key to the company's success was control of the Eastern trade. The key to the Eastern trade was successful shipping. The key to shipping was the Cape replenishment station. Decades later, he himself discovered what was still lacking in that tottering house of cards, that the key to the Cape replenishment station was its outposts. And these outposts, which are central to the novel, are strung out along the southern coast of what is now South Africa, and then including the string of islands leading to the rich trading grounds of Batavia. The south facing coastline and southern Indian Ocean island sites are depicted as central to the maritime imperial interests of the company, but also, you know, in some ways peripheral to um, indigenous society in this novel. Um, we can talk a little bit more about the novel in the questions if we want, um, but I thought it was interesting that um, there's quite a lot. I mean, one of the first two, um, uh, the third section, so out of the seven sections, um, the third section starts off floating uh, with, with the main character Bartholomew Forms, uh, known as Bart for the rest of the section. He's depicted floating in the limitless ocean northeast of Mauritius. The ocean surrounding the sailor is not only limitless, but bottomless. Um, to quote, it was a place uh, of which to this day the maps say no bottom. He's sort of drifted, he's been shipwrecked, drifted for two days in the clear skies and calm waters after a cyclone. Um, and even uh, um, uh, there's a sense in which uh, in the passage, if you read this sort of few pages around it, there's just a sense of the vast oceanic spread all the way to the kind of cold waters of the south, the deeps, the far south. Um, 
when they eventually, um, when Bart sort of arrives on the on the Mauritian islands, um, they proceed just a few sailors to completely decimate its ecology. So um, they're at first attracted by all the many dodos and tortoises and tame animals. Um, but by the time they left at the end of this kind of chapter, uh, the dodos were finished already to quote, the tortoises were used up. The last palm wine was finished, the tops of all their trees, uh, of all the trees on the island were shorn off and each top hollowed out like a pot, all the trees are dead. It's a pattern described repeatedly and brutally throughout the novel of settlement, deformation, and deforestation, um, which is true of the Southern Indian Ocean islands as well as coastlines. Um, Hedley Twidle has a great paper on this, and he notes that um, Slay, who's also an archival researcher, um, revealed that uh, in contrast to, for instance, the depiction of the Cape um, as a garden, colonization of the Cape was less a case of planting than a relentless process of deforestation. Um, this, the Southern Indian Ocean is depicted in the novel as at least partly a zone of interrelated connection and extraction. So the novel also depicts these very cosmopolitan societies even in this early period, but also talks about histories of whaling and sealing, um, which are um, prevalent throughout the, the region. Um, okay, just to conclude, at the same time as, as depicting this kind of zone of instruction, the sea in the novel also escapes and exceeds the homogenizing forces of empire. Um, in the novel, the sea is, is vividly described. It um, produces a sudden storm that, um, that destroys the fleet of ships and shipwrecks spot forms. Um, it also, there's a beautiful scene about the mass moonlit landing of thousands of turtles. Um, Thing, things that become important in the, in the novel is sort of the, the white glass ear bone of a whale. Along with its representation as a highway of connection and zone of extraction, the Southern Indian Ocean appears in the novel as what Margaret Cohen calls blue water. Um, she calls this a chronotype of the sea that covers the high seas and is often the site of rare occurrences. So these extravagant and strange events that, limit, that stretch the limits of realist narration. This is her definition. Exceeding the powers of the imagination as well as conventional plausibility, the extravagance of blue water happenings is not a mark of their fanciful status as in some literary contexts. Rather, it is testimony to their existence. Blue water events are strange and therefore true. In this way, as you can see on the screen, I've linked it to um, this uh, really you know, important challenge to our thinking, which is um, which I've got in the grain derangement. Um, Who's, who's posed that climate change poses a similar challenge to our thinking. Southern seas and sea fiction may they offer a site and model for the kinds of writing required to face the urgent improbabilities of climate change. At a minimum, they might point us to the sea itself. And I'll just end with this um, quote from the first section of our islands, which is called Voices from the Sea. And at last the sea, the green womb water in which we drift and drifted once. Deep inside it lives the worm Leviathan and on it or cast up beside it people like foam. And we can stop there and move to discussion. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, this was a very thought provoking presentation. And so I would hand over to Dr. Marconi to begin the question and discussion. Prof, you are, you, are, you are muted. Okay, I've unmuted myself now. Thank you very much for this uh, thought-provoking discussion. Um, I would like you to um, help me fill in some gaps, um, fairly big gaps in my thinking about this, about this particular issue. Um, why is this mass of uh, ocean called Indian Ocean. You have Africa on the one side, India on the other, Australia, Antarctica. Historically, who named it Indian Ocean? And why? I mean, I, I'm trying to make sense of, if I'm in Antarctica, why would I call this mass of water in front of me Indian Ocean? What is the, this is just, uh, uh, a pedantic question from a linguist. 
why do they call this place Indian Ocean? What is the trajectory of the naming of this particular mass of water? Yeah, I mean, uh, guess guess who named it? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, the British, and because mm -hmm. they had, you know, India was the jewel in the crown of empire, um, mm -hmm. the important part to them of the Indian Ocean. Um, it's been named different things over over time. Um, Arab world called it kind of the Arab Ocean. Uh, oh, okay. you know, it spoke to different regions that were kind of smaller uh -huh. and relevant. In fact, two two terms have been proposed that proposed that would be much more um, egalitarian. Uh, uh -huh. One is one is uh, Gaurav Desai has proposed the term Afrasian Sea, uh, okay. which is much a, a much more egalitarian term and 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 draws in African coastlines because a major part of of thinking through the South is actually to to focus on Africa as part uh -huh. of the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. um, and, and different writers have done that. Abdul Razak Gurna, I, I have a chapter on him in my book, and you know he's finally got some recognition as one of the key writers that draws in the Southwest Indian Ocean, which is really the, okay. the African section. And Gaurav Desai has also written about how we should actually just change the name and call it the Afrasian Sea to, to, to draw in as completely central African wow. shores. Um, there's even a, a slightly more bolshy uh, version of this um, by um Yvonne Adiambo Awar, uh, mm -hmm. who who suggests calling it the Swahili Seas because she says like that's the kind of okay. um you know much more much more uh, predominant um actor in, mm -hmm. in in a large part of the ocean but mm -hmm. but also I think wanting to redress <laughs> this sort of kind of naming injustice which mm -hmm. which it which results from a focus on India which also keeps the kind of uh, thinking around the Indian Ocean very much in the northern hemisphere, the small northern yes, hemisphere. Yes. Yeah. So um, just to continue with that, um, what do scholars or writers from the from Antarctica call the Indian Ocean? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's uh, the 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 fantastic thing. I'm actually working on a different paper right now uh -huh. about how to think about Antarctica in relation to, for instance, colonialism. Yes, there's yes. nobody in Antarctica. And it's not like the other places where the colonists insisted nobody was there before, uh, like mm. Australia, when there were people there mm -hmm. before. Um, Antarctica really doesn't have anyone that can live there permanently. Yes. Uh, yeah. Now, scientists can't live there permanently. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I love the idea, of, and I've played with this a bit in my thinking about what if we did take and, and mm. a, a fictional, hypothetical, yes. Arctic perspective, yeah. what would we call the Indian Ocean? Mm. Um, mm. That sort of uh, distant warm sea to the far north <laughs> mm. <laughs> would be, mm. would be mm. one option. But I've also, you know, played with this idea and thinking like, okay, well, who does live in Antarctica? Penguins. So what yes. would be a penguin's view? Of oh, yeah, yes, of, of, of yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yes. And then um, I was trying to follow up your argument carefully. Is your overall argument that um, scholarship about or on the global south is oceanic scholarship? Is that the argument that you are making? That, um, the, that when we are thinking of scholarship about the global south, we must we are intellectually compelled to think about the ocean. In other words, that it is the ocean that is the that should be the key driving imaginary of our thinking about the global south. Is that the argument? Not exactly. Not exactly. What, but, what is what okay. is the exact <laughs> argument? What is the exact argument? Mm. Uh, well, definitely not the most important. No, no, not the, okay, about, okay, right. But a yes. a, a second, argument. Okay. Yeah. And, and partly because um, I, I think in this notion of, of the global south, you know, it does mm. track, uh, but not quite perfectly onto the, the southern hemisphere. Yes. So one of the things that we wanted to think with, which was how to think more materially about, about that link between southness and, and global southness, which yes. is really a political economic category. Mm -hmm. um, 
and 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 when we were thinking about okay what is distinctive about the global south one is its histories of colonization so yes. post-colonial countries for the most part is what we're talking about when we talk about the global south mm. um but if we think about these more material things and also about its contemporary challenges and one is you know histories of colonization yes. colonization we live with those challenges every day but the other one are, are kind of new challenges and one of them is to do with um climate change warming planet mm. and, and mm. that it affects the southern hemisphere more um more ex in more extreme ways which mm. is partly a result of this this uh, that economic status but also very much um a result of just the way the planet is tilted mm. um and the fact that and uh, which I actually had a globe with me because if you look if you tilt it to mm. the north you can see mm -hmm. it's all land if you mm -hmm. tilt it to the south it's all sea it's all, it's all so, sea. Okay. so i think it's been an overlooked part mm -hmm. of global mm -hmm. self studies and um, the fact that one of the things that's distinctive about it you know instead of just focusing on the thing that's distinctive about the global south is relative poverty mm -hmm. um and histories of colonization and settler colonialism another thing which is distinctive about it is its higher degree of oceanicity and that mm -hmm. might complicate our thinking around um, the global south and also orient that thinking a little bit more towards the future or the ways in which you know histories of maritime empire which we call maritime for a reason are linked to these futures of rising seas in um on kind of islands in the region so you are saying that the issues about oceanicity and the global south give us an indication of what the future might be might look like that we, we go back to the global south, not to capture it, the history of the planet, but to get a prologue of what the future might be. Is that the argument? It's, that, yeah. That, that, it, the, it, it, that we're in a paradoxical situation where the global south is a prelude to, a precursor to, what the future might look like of the planet. That's, yeah. okay, let me put it more dramatically. Yeah. The global south is tomorrow, the global north is yesterday. That, that's very much the argument that um, theory from the south, the- uh, Yes, uh, yes, yes, uh, Jean and John Kamarov. Yeah, Mike. the Kamarovs. Yeah. Uh, the Komarovs are definitely making that argument that the global mm -hmm. south is the laboratory for northern futures. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a test case, a laboratory. Um, one of the ways in which I think that is true is, uh -huh. um, it, I mean, it's, it's a little bit of a pessimistic view. It's kind of anti <laughs> view. Yep, okay. <laughs> um, uh, and I don't know if it completely holds water. It's like a nice provocative thought, yeah. but um, haha, holds water. Um, <laughs> it's actually impossible to avoid puns in this field. I have to say. Yes, yes. Because yes, and, yes. and and several scholars have pointed out the ways in which um, ocean travel was so predominant a form of exploration and underlied the economy so much in in the eighteenth uh, nineteenth centuries that our language is infused. You know, Shakespeare. You know, the English language is infused with with maritime metaphors, mm. which is part mm. of the pun problem. But also to say, you know, this is partly we, this is laboratory laboratory for the futures and mm -hmm. um for the future of the planet. But also to say that, you know, it, it, it does still help us to remember things like um the the histories of imperialism because that imperialism for its most part was driven by maritime networks. Yes. Um, and that gets a little bit forgotten in mm -hmm. our um, focus on land and, and land-based justice. Uh. Um, so th there's a sense in which the ocean is a little bit invisibilized in ways that make it um, as, a, as a bit vulnerable to um, forgetting that the sea is, you know, is central to both our histories and our futures. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me ask the last, pose the last question, and then I give over to Edwin because there are a number of my colleagues who want to jump in. I am, let me put it more dramatically, I, I get you when you talk about it. But what I was wondering was, if I'm studying Pacific Ocean, do those who study the Pacific Ocean have anything to say about Indian Ocean? Or do the, those who study the Pacific Ocean just concentrate on the Pacific Ocean? 
what is my intellectual jurisdiction if I'm studying the Pacific Ocean? And similarly, are there people who study the Indian Ocean like you, for example? What do you have to say about the Pacific Ocean and other oceans, the Atlantic Ocean? Or your uh, intellectual jurisdictions are divided by the oceans that you are dealing with? Yeah, I mean, you point to a real uh, issue of, of of how these academic fields overlap and don't overlap. I mean, one one of the ways in which this has operated uh, is, you know, over over the his, the intellectual history of oceanic yeah. studies is very much that it starts off um, focused on Caribbean, yes, um, which then led into kind of studies of Black Atlantic, mm -hmm. so the Atlantic histories and the ways that those connected. Um, Africa and the US, mm -hmm. um, also quite Northern hemispheric centered. Uh, the Indian Ocean is a later addition in, in terms of the scholarship. Um, uh, and the Pacific has just always been quite separate, okay. um, kind of developed on its own trajectory and quite separately. I, I wrote one paper that was trying to link Pacific and uh, and Indian Ocean studies via the, the figure of the castaway because the castaway yes. I mean I mentioned in this paper very famous in Pacific studies if you think uh -huh. of Robert Stevenson etc but um, there's quite a lot of Indian Ocean writers for instance that bring in that figure of the castaway Gurna Christiansa etc um, and so but I was trying to do that and it's actually very difficult the Pacific is um, a very interesting I mean the ways that I'm interested in the Southern Ocean because it's big it's oceanic yes. it's not much land not many people the pacific is very similar in that way okay. it's like again if you tilt the globe not this way but this way uh -huh. the whole one side of it is just ocean you know that's the pacific it's huge mm -hmm. um and and in some ways there's not enough um in science in oceanography and i think that's going to feed into humanity scholarship quite soon um, mm. There's increasing emphasis on calling the ocean the world ocean rather than breaking mm. it up into these groups um, mm. and looking at, at global planetary ocean circulations that link mm. all these regions, not just the monsoon, which is one part of yes. it, um, or the trade winds in the Atlantic, but seeing this global ocean circulation and the ocean, there's a fantastic image of all the land just in the middle and the whole ocean connected around it. Yes. one map projection. Um, it, I do think that in one, so I think that we're headed in that direction. We should be more uh, thinking across oceans as scholars mm -hmm. um, and between them. One just like hesitant pushback is that it is important, I think, uh, you know, in the kind of uh, couple of decades ago in post-colonial studies, mm -hmm. people would just talk about Africa or the post yes, yes, yes. very generalizing. And I do think there is something important about not forgetting that there are specific particular histories in each of these places and you can't mm -hmm. really always generalize across them so okay. to remain grounded in a uh -huh. region I think there is there's something important about staying focused on the on the particular on the okay. of a particular region yeah mm. okay thank you very much um Edwin um yeah thank you thank yeah. you so there are a couple of questions um and I'll begin with Mohammed's question. Um, so Mohammed, say hello, Professor Lavery. Greetings from Morocco. <laughs> yeah. Um, so thank you for a very interesting presentation. Could you please say a little bit more about the contribution of oceanic epistemologies to the debates around coloniality, post-coloniality, and the global South tracking back at the epistemologies of the erstwhile colonial north. What will be the contributions to a liberation epistemology? And yeah, he concludes by saying thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much, Mohammed. Um, I want to first flag the danger of oceanic epistemologies. Uh, and that is a danger that is, is uh, quite a live issue, which is to say, um, if I just even speak to my context here in South Africa, um, you know, here we're dealing with legacies of uh, um, the the stealing of land and uh, a lack of land based justice uh, in our in our contemporary moment. You know, that's the things that are urgent here are um, 
uh, uh, land claims and, and redistribution of both land and wealth. And so one of the critiques of uh, an oceanic studies is that, is that um, scholars are turning to the ocean to avoid those hard questions about resti land restitution. Um, so, and I think it's worth keeping that firmly in mind, you know, with, with everything that we're doing. And the other thing is that, you know, uh, that instead of, um, uh, you know, we've all heard of greenwashing uh, when you, you take uh, an environmental issue to, to kind of a brush existing uh, social injustice under the rug. Um, and so this would be the equivalent here would be blue washing, you know, are we just blue washing um, urgent uh, uh, questions of liberation and justice. Um, I think those things, that's a, that's a very valid concern, but what it can offer, so we, we've um, just done a special issue that came out this year, I think it's great, I highly recommend all the papers in it it's from interventions called Reading for Water. And one of the, the kind of provocations that we were dealing with is that if you do only focus on land, you it, it's possible to miss a whole other area of, of injustice, which is that um, uh, that there needs to be a water justice as well. And that again is a maybe future oriented question that also goes back to kind of longer durée of, uh, of how land was divided up was actually based on its water resources. You know, that uh, what, what's good soils, which are based on water and their structure, um, uh, the sources of fresh water rivers, et cetera. So to not lose, um, to, to, to not be allowed, for instance here, to, for land restitution to be in some ways a bit of a joke because you get given land back with, but with all its soil and water leached away. Um, so to, to retain a focus on, um, on oceanic or hydro epistemologies is actually a way of, 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 of keeping a focus on what's really at stake in these, in these debates about justice. Um, and it's also partly this, um, the, the question of, of how to think through this contemporary environmental crisis at the same time as, as ongoing economic uh, inequalities. Um, we're having to deal with those at the same time. And th there's a way in which you can say it's not, it's, it can't be blue washing if it's, if it's real and it's happening. And, you know, the recent IPCC report um, was just like Africa's going to be the worst affected by climate change. That's a reality that we have to face. Um, so, thinking with knowledges about the ocean and particularly critical of the ways in which those knowledges have been erased um, and, and, and retrieving them. So part of the work, it's a very long answer now, but part of the work that we've been doing in the Oceanic Humanities for the Global South project is recovering relationships to ocean that are locally grounded. Um, so, and, and, and it's not easy because I think there's a kind of antipathy to, to thinking oceanically, partly because you know, there had to be a focus on land, on the post-colonial nation as against in the decolonizing era. Um, but uh, the, the sense of the ocean as an ancestral home, as an inspirited waters uh, from whole different kinds of knowledge systems, um, uh, all of all of these forms of knowledges could underpin a much more decolonized uh, kind of conservation and um, ecologically minded agenda. Thank you so much. Um, so Mary, Mary is also asking a question, which is quite in line with Mohammed's question. And Mary is saying, how does your argument connect the ontological turn of sea and ocean as ontology? Or as Mohammed put it, oceanic epistemologies. So what's the connection between the two? Yeah, yeah also a great question. And I can um, sort of begin to answer it with a sort of anecdote about how we came to the project, um, which was is was partly um, by the pressure of the sea's ontology on our thinking. Um, you know, it's it's very material presence and strange characteristics, which are becoming revealed as it changes. So the sea is very much a changing sea. The sea I was working on um, with the Indian Ocean, the, the, the very 
um, monsoon, which had lasted for hundreds of years, thousands of years, is changing in this moment. So that kind of uh, the materiality of why and how that was changing and how it was going to affect the people living on those coastlines is part of what motivated us to look at the sea as an ontological um, uh, as entity. No, no, space is a little bit vague. Um, uh, and and I mean, as as a result, I was I was working on Indian Ocean imaginaries, and and um, Isabel Hoffman was working on that. Our, our colleagues Sharad Chari and Param Pamela Gupta um, were were looking at histories and geographies of the Indian Ocean, and we all actually went and did an online oceanography course to really get to grips with what what what's happening in this region. And it's a different kind of interdisciplinarity than the humanities is typically um, doing. You know, we. We are used to doing interdisciplinarity across history, anthropology, um, uh, geography, um, those law, those kinds of disciplines. But to bring in marine biology, um, oceanography, climate science is quite a, a challenge to our um, the ways in which I think we're trained. But it's it's part of this thing that that it's also important to consider the non-human world. So it's um, it's a it's a taking a more multi-species perspective, um, and and one that is attentive to the elements, so the land and water that are the substrate of our thinking. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. I'd like to ask, I would like to ask a question too. Um, so while you were talking, I was thinking about territorialization of water. And so like some people, some of some countries and some global superpowers kind of if they're as part, let's say somewhere in the Indian Ocean, if there's oil and if there are some natural resources, some of these superpowers, um, they kind of territorialize it. So I wanted to know how this, your take on this and how this also plays into the argument, where there's a fight for some parts of rivers and oceans and all that, yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the things about dealing with the materiality of the sea is a recognition that, and in a lot of the oceanic scholarship, the ocean is just a metaphor for liquidity. Um, so fluidity uh, in general. So, okay, we have fluidity across disciplines or something, and the sea can be used as a metaphor for that. And one of the things that we, it's very clear from, from any engagement with the materiality of the sea is that um, it, it's not just general unboundedness. There is a, a certain amount of kind of fluctuance, pressure that that exerts a certain pressure on our thinking, but it's in fact highly policed, highly territorialized. Um, things like the exclusive economic zones of each country that has changed very much over the course of the 20th century. It's been expanded to include the continental shelf. Those are... Um, uh, um, uh, being mobilized uh, in what um, various countries are calling the blue economy, which is mostly uh, the result um, or going to be operationalized as overfishing uh, and mineral exploration. The Indian Ocean in particular is very vulnerable to the, both of those two things because it's um, uh, poorly policed based on the global southness of the region. Um, it's not enough capacity and um, the southwest Indian Ocean in fact I just had a meeting yesterday with a scholar um, at Pretoria who's working on um, you know on contemporary challenges around military involvement between China the US and India in the southwest Indian Ocean so it's really a theater on which con current military activity is playing out and it's being used kind of in, as the Cold War happened it's being used as a proxy for current um, geopolitical um wrangling um and it's it, it's it's i mean even with there's a there's an organization here in south africa called oceans not oil um which is trying to prevent the um seismic surveys for oil um around the coastlines in south africa's eez um there's uh, deep sea mining licenses have been granted on exactly those sea mountain ridges that are showed in the image um, by the International Seabed Authority in Jamaica um, this year. So this year um, there's um, a, a move uh, started from the Pacific Islands actually, but it's going to play out in, in part in the Indian Ocean regions and 
um, the kind of neighboring countries to the Indian Ocean are not going to get any benefit as far as we can see from those deep sea mining activities. So there is a bit of a sea grab um, going on now. So the, and, and, and these regions are not um, uh, kind of fluid and connecting in a, in a necessarily or positive way. Um, and yeah, we have to be attentive to the ways in which the, the sea is a highly territorialized space and it actually increasingly so, and it's invisibility and invisibilization is, is playing into that. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, Christine is also asking this question that do you see connections between oceanic studies and indigenous epistemologies? For example, regarding the concept of water, ocean and river, um, do rivers or oceans speak? Yeah, so one of the things that uh, over the last five years of this project, um, that was a surprise. You know, we started off with a set of questions. One of the questions which has emerged as, as central is um, what are alternative knowledge systems, alternative and indigenous knowledge systems that can be drawn on to think through these very difficult questions of land water um, relationships and so on. Um, particularly, so these are much more developed ideas in other parts of the world, which um, have a, a longer history of well, actually just have different kinds of seas. So those um, places that uh, uh, abut onto seas, which are um, slightly more uh, friendly. So um, there's something about these very wild coastlines that particularly we have around Africa, which, which means that um, communities weren't necessarily over the last several thousand or hundred, hundreds of years, um, necessarily able to do much seafaring in wooden boats, for instance, whereas um, the Pacific Islanders developed that technology a lot earlier. Um, uh, also at places in kind of the North Pacific um, regions on the US coast, indigenous epistemologies. They are um, coming into play. There's a, a novel sheet down there that, um, that uh, addresses these kind of North Pacific um, and Mozambican indigenous epistemologies of the sea. Um, the, the, um, where we have found it, um, it's been quite a few projects based um, out of the graduate community at the Ocean Humanities Project that have talked about, again, seeing the sea as the site of um, uh, ancestral um, home, as a, a, a site of where ancestors are, um, are live and are, are based. Um, there's also uh, beliefs in water spirits that um, I think are, are quite actually kind of complex and interesting in, in relation to the ways in which water materially functions. Um, not reducible to, but in, in interrelationship with. Um, it's, it's very much a, um, an ongoing area of scholarship, I think, around the world. And it, particularly the ways, and I'm not sure it needs to be this, but the ways in which um, Indigenous perspectives about, um, uh, I, I guess, that the non-human world is not so separate from the human world. That's the kind of overarching idea, how those can be used to environmental ends, environmentalist ends. Okay, that's, that's, yeah, thank you so much. And then um, Scott is asking a question, How's the, how does gender feature in your analysis? So he was thinking out of how the oceans seem always to be placed dominated by rough worded men. And on the South Atlantic side, wow. there is a gendering or sexualization, the admaster or third story. So his question is, are there equivalents that are relevant to the South African scene? Yeah, the question of gender is fascinating in this in this area, um, uh, particularly with seafaring being a predominantly masculine activity, and uh, um, Abdurazik Gurna in one of his novels has this uh, fantastic line about how um, you know the sea is this place of kind of freedom and connection. Um, so that you can go across the sea and explore. It's also a place of abandonment. And it's mostly the men who abandon the women who are the ones left behind having to deal with the consequences. Not a direct quote. Um, but that, that, that there's something about the oceanic which is deeply gendered. 
Um, it, it, you can, I think, approach the question from a number of different angles. I mean, even though the, those who do travel the seas are tended to be these like Hemingway figures. <laughs> um, I think that that needs to be troubled. But even in, you know, if you look at um, histories of Zanzibar, it's still uh, Nakodas are the, uh, those who the captains of the Dows um, are still largely men. Um, uh, and that kind of amphibious coastline is, is, is a much more um, uh, both gendered um, place. So the collecting of seaweed for food, um, dealing with uh, the shoreline, food, uh, kind of a, a everyone involved in, in fishing and at least its aftermaths and, and sails, th those kinds of things are a slightly more cross-gendered space. Um, but uh, and then on the other hand, you've got these really, I mean, you talked about the, the myths of um, uh, the gendered myths of the kind of titans of the sea, uh, the Adamaster story, um, linking into Greek mythology as well. Um, but on the other hand, w women being associated and their bodies with wateriness um, and oceans and moons, you know, so there, there's a very kind of weirdly, I don't think very productively gendered cultural history of the sea. Um, but and I think highlighting uh, myths and stories that take a slightly different angle, for instance, I mean, we, we have um, had two graduate students working on, and our colleagues working on um, uh, myths of water spirits, which are roughly kind of mermaid myths, you know, a half woman, half fish. Um, so ways in which that, and they take a, a wide variety of um, sort of run the gamut from like a siren figure to um, a much more beneficial figure. Um, uh, but th there are ways of highlighting these alternative um, gendered stories of the sea that I think are worthwhile because sometimes it can be easy just to accept the um, patriarchal uh, view of the sea without trying to recover alternative stories and histories. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Marie has a follow-up question. Hey, Marie. Yes, thank you. Um, this is a follow-up building on Christine's question about the connection between indigenous epistemologies and oceanic epistemologies. Um, I, based on what I heard from you uh, in relation to more attention to post-humans, not post-humans, but non-humans, the way you describe seems to be um, sort of similar to new feminist, new materialist orientation rather than indigenous orientation. Although you said you're looking at uh, alternative knowledge systems, can you sort of talk more about it? Like it reminded me of the writing of Don Donna Haraway and other uh, humanities people. Yeah, I think part of my hesitation is that the, these um, uh, the, the field of indigenous studies is so vast and diverse, and I'm not e exactly, you know, in some ways I feel like I don't um, have the place to speak uh, on those topics. One of the places where I can point you to um, the places where this work is being done um, really well, one of them is Canadian scholarship on um, on indigenous knowledges of, of sea and water, um, particularly from the West Coast. Um, Australian, uh, um, Meg Samuelson touches on some of those in the article I shared. Um, so um, notions of, of country and sea country among Ab Aboriginal Australians. Um, the, the kind of language of indigenous studies doesn't, um, uh, isn't quite the way in which certainly an Africa-based scholarship necessarily um, uh, proceeds. Uh, partly because of the the you know the, this is this is the majority um, uh, in you know if, if you talk about indigenous belief systems it's both huge it's kind of like you know you can't talk about Africa as a country you can't talk about the indigenous belief system so if you are, are, are doing work really interesting work on um, uh, a whole uh, we just like really a whole bunch of different um, conceptualizations of water and oceans in relation to um, I guess uh, various forms of what we might call local tradition, um, but even those are really complicated and, and need to be historicized. So uh, uh, there is a uh, maybe a, a negative tendency to think of um, indigenous 
indigenous knowledge systems as all very kind of positive and ecologically minded. But I think there actually just needs to be much more and better work on, on what those are in, in detail. Um, there has been work here on um, Zulu relationships to the sea and fish and water, um, uh, Swahili, there's been a fair bit, a little bit more. Um, one of our students has worked on um, even kind of uh, land, landlocked countries and um, uh, traditions of importing seawater and shells and, and what those um, kind of impl implications have for drawing the sea into land. Um, um, but but so that's just taking the African perspective, um, what well, with just even this like small region. Um, but I yeah, I I think from the um th there is overlap, and partly because Donna Haraway, et cetera, and those feminist epistemologies, also um Daisy Alimo, um Astrida Naimanis, um, are in fact, or particularly Astrida, she's based on that kind of um, West Coast of Canada scholarship in, influenced. So her, this, these kind of feminist in, um, uh, scholarship of embodiment is in fact linked to and influenced by um, indigenous studies, I think. Thank you. Thank you. And then um, Heboho also asked, he, he's asking a question. Um, so his question is, for the articulation of ocean and sea social cultural and economic dimensions. In his mind, all seas and oceans have been claimed and laws enacted to consolidate ownership. So he thinks you reconcile sea area, area laws, which he gives two mile distance right from land to nations on the coast and the independent discussion of the areas of the sea without reference to ownership conferred by law. So from, from the middle question he's asking, from the middle question he's asking, can you reconcile? I think he's asking about the loss of the sea, the enactment, and then consolidating ownership. The way if my if I've not articulated it well, you can jump in and let me know. But that's yeah, I, one of these the issues about talking about the sea in general is that it's a bit like talking about land in general. Um, and we, we, we're already used to distinguishing different kinds of land, um, both politically, geographically, et cetera, but we're, we're less good at doing that in the sea. One of the very important ways, and we were talking about territorialization, is the way in which um, uh, the maritime legal structure is uh, it, it kind of overlays onto the sea. Um, um, no, not all seas and oceans have been claimed, in fact. In fact, a large part of the sea is what they call the high sea. So it's an un, um, no, not claimed by any, um, uh, or, or not recognized as owned by any nation. Um, it's in fact the, the high seas, the seabed um, in, in, within the high seas and Antarctica are the only places on the planet that actually are outside of any national jurisdiction. It's quite a wild thought, really. Um, uh, and in one of the things about the high seas is that the law on the high seas is very thin <laughs> on the ground. Um, there's not a lot of um, actual law in place, and there's very little um, uh, policing. So there's very little um, backing up of that law. Or in, uh, what, do, what do you call it? Um, I've lost the word. But anyway, there's, there's not that much um, of... Uh, the law is a little bit fictional in those areas. Enforcement, thank you. Very little enforcement, thank you very much. <laughs> it's late on a Friday afternoon. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so the the these things are really important. I mean that that um, uh, the distinction between coastal waters, those places that are claimed and policed. Uh, to the extent that is possible by a nation, um, and the difference between that and the high seas and the seabed is, is really, like a really important distinction. Um, however, it's also not 
Um, the EEZs were only mid 20th century inventions um, when the US after the Second World War was like, we would like more land. And so everyone claimed, I mean, more jurisdiction over the sea. And then everyone claimed more jurisdiction over the sea. So no one actually knows what to do with these vast regions yet. South Africa, for instance, has a massive coastline and also owns the Prince Edward Islands. And as a result, has like 10 times more sea um, uh, area under its purview than it does land. Um, but that's it's very much still notional. Like there's not um, uh, that much sense of what to do with it or how to, for instance, enforce fishing in um, in its waters. Um, so I do think, um, I guess one of the challenges that I'm just, have been trying to think about is is given that almost no one has experience of the high seas directly. Very few people. Some kind of uh, captains of of, of giant container ships that have cannot even feel the sea when they're working. Um, uh, those a few people that have gone on like leisure cruises, which is a very also unreal way to experience the sea. Um, but you know these things, these places are nevertheless important for our lives on land. Um, and so I guess one of the ways in which I talk to um, scientists and climate scientists about this is that it, these things need to be drawn into public awareness. Um, and we know that even though they are, seem quite far from our experience and day-to-day -day lives, they also are important. Like, you know, what, what happens to the sea as it changes one or two degrees in temperature impacts on the droughts that um, are really important to our food production systems. Um, so even though those high seas are so far away and outside of um, our imagination. I guess one of the challenges is how to bring them in. Yeah. Th thank you so much. Um, I think there are no more questions and no one has raised their hands up, but I, oh, Prof. Yes, I, I have a, a couple of questions to continue with this conversation. You said that um, this is part of a project called Oceanic Humanities for the Global South. My question is, um, is there a curriculum for this Oceanic Humanities for the Global South? And if so, what are the courses or modules that students have to take um, if they are interested in this Oceanic Humanities for the Global South? If, for example, uh, uh, somebody instructed me to set up a series of courses for a, a degree program called Oceanic Humanities for the Global South, what would I include? Sure, what a fun idea. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to develop this course and everyone would have mm -hmm. to take some, you know, maritime history, some uh, a little bit of information from and they'd have to take a legal course on, on the law of the sea, um, uh, an oceanography course, marine biology course, um, and then uh, kind of poetics of the sea, indigenous knowledges of the sea, um, etc. But unfortunately, there isn't one yet. There isn't one yet. You know, a okay. whole degree program. Okay. However, there are courses. Um, so there's one at, that we teach at WITS in the MA program. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a postgraduate course. I think it's honors in MA. Um, which we called underwater aesthetics, and Isabel Hoffman has taken that to NYU. So there's an underwater aesthetics course there. Um, uh, the, the kind of sections that, for instance, as an example from this, um, we, we were focused on, on this is in the Department of African Literature Advice, and we were focused on um, literary and other cultural forms of of engagement with oceans and there's a section on rising seas there's an in a section on inundating or drowning um uh imaginaries of tsunamis um uh, there's one on ship journeys um there's uh, quite a lot of i mean it's, it's actually a surprising amount of i guess artistic engagement with the submarine um uh, histories of coral reefs ways of seeing underwater. Uh, there's been Margaret Cohn and others have done work on that. Um, so we, we, I can, um, I've also been gathering, so colleagues that have been interested in these things for a while, our colleague Sharad at Berkeley has a, a course on, on oceans. Nick Samuelson has a course on oceans. So if I guess if we put together all of these um, 
uh, I bet I bet a street it is too. I've just seen that in Chanel's mm -hmm. message in the chat. Um, if we put all of us together, but it's mostly, I mean, in some ways, I, you know, I'm 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 interested in these oceanic questions as a mm -hmm. way of linking together um, different geographies and 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 big questions. So how to think, you know, climate justice and 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 colonization together. Um, but it's still, you know, it's still a, a somewhat, um, as my family likes to tell me, a somewhat obscure area of study. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's really a way to think about these things, but it's not. Um, uh, and, and I think would be actually interesting as a way to think about uh, to, to do a degree program. Maybe we should. Mm -hmm. um, have a chat sometime about. <laughs> yes, I think I think we should. I think we should. Yeah. Um, it would be good to have a degree program on oceanic studies and that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it actually is. Sorry, just to add one little thought is there's mm -hmm. a um, something that's run out of Cape Town is is a program called the Semester at Sea. This it's, oh. it's called the Sea Mester pun again, um, uh, and the Sea Mester is a is only aimed at the moment at um, uh, people that might, so it's on the, the ship, which uh, South Africa, the South African government owns, which can go to Antarctica, it's an icebreaker. Um, uh, and um, uh, it's, I think, three weeks and, and students do a kind of um, half a semester of work from different disciplines. So there's, uh, they get, have a lecture in oceanography, a lecture in, um, a, bathymetry, um, et cetera. Um, and I, I have a sort of um, hope that one day I can I can join as a lecturer on on poetics or or, or literary yes. representations yes. of the sea yeah. as one way of, of synthesizing all of those different knowledges, because otherwise mm -hmm. people just have a really kind of narrow view of oceans. But I do think there is an important part of the course, the future mm -hmm. um, degree program in in oceanic studies, which which would require, I think, an embodied experience of being out okay. on the high sea okay. or diving, or you know, something that um, is is kind of links scholars and students to the the material world that we're actually engaging with. Um, also, can, a point I know that people are adding in links in the in the in the chat, but there's mm. a Pulgrave handbook on blue heritage. Um, which uh, which is also a really great resource, um, Marie, on um, various kinds of indigenous engagement as well as other forms of um, of ways of considering heritage in relation to the ocean and in also in relation mm -hmm. to the global south. Now, uh, let me continue with you as I uh, play with my own mind. Um, how much do you know at the moment about how the individuals who dive into the sea are trained? Are they also trained in terms of all the poetics about the sea, or is just at the moment they're only trained to become experts at diving into the sea? Um, really great question. It, it mm -hmm. kind of depends from where, and I'm. I'm oh, I'm, okay. No, but I think there's a. Um, the scholarship on this is a bit vague because it's it's dealing with kind of a longer history, but um, uh, uh, in histories of navigation, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, and diving, Pacific Islanders um, navigation systems were apparently story based. So those two things oh, were the same. Okay, you know, they were both okay. the training for being uh, a, a maritime practitioner and um, being familiar with the stories of the sea were, were one mm -hmm. in the same thing. Um, but again, that's a kind of an anthropological question. Um, the the early divers, you know, when when diving with technological equipment was developed, which was very European centred, um, those early divers uh, came up for the first time, sort of seeing the life underwater vividly. And there'd been other, you know, there's histories of Indian Ocean pearl divers. There's a great mm -hmm. new book on that, um, and other very much. Um, there was histories of uh, diving to do with enslavement. There's West African divers and swimmers. So these, um, there's a fantastic new history on um, African American um, uh, aquatics. Um, so histories of swimming and and diving. Um, I must get the book. It's somewhere here. Um, uh, but but the 
the European tradition, so like William Beebe and those people that were developing those um, ways of diving with the glass thing on your head, um, at, when they came up and and had been able were able to describe what life was looked like under the sea for the first time, they didn't have any way of describing it without turning to. Uh, for instance, poetry. So they were going back to Rimbaud and French symbolist yeah. poetry because it's kind of crazy what's under there and it all looks mm. so wild and different and your perception changes. So there's there's a very long history of um, uh, needing to uh, not only train in a kind of scientific way or a practical way to be um, engaging with this, but, all, but requiring the um, I guess the mental hooks that an imaginative mm -hmm. cultural history provides. Let me just make the last um, comment, then we can move on to the after party, which is more exciting. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a question. Oh, you. okay, just jump in, Sally. Jump in. No, I was going to ask you. No, I was going to ask about an irrelevant question. I was going to say we're talking about land, sea, what about air? Is there anything called air ontology? But um, but that's not important. Jump in, jump Coco. in. Yeah. Mm. Sally Coco. Mm. Yeah, um, a whole lot of what you said makes me thinking, makes me think of how the rest of the world was explored by Europe since the 15th century. And, and by that time, uh, Europe had depended very much on uh, the Silk Road. And Silk Road, there's one that was terrestrial, uh, going all the way from China to Turkey. But there was also a silk, uh, a, um, sea part of the Silk Road along the coast of Asia all the way also to the Suez Canal. Um, the, Suez, the, I'm sorry, the Red Sea, not Suez, Suez Canal didn't exist yet until the Red Sea. And by the uh, 16th century, when people thought of the Indian Ocean as Indian Ocean, my understanding is that uh, the Indian Ocean was referred to as Eastern Sea by people in Africa and Western Sea by the Chinese. Mm -hmm. And in both cases, they had to navigate uh, um, southward when they got to India. And that may be the reason why India gave its name to the ocean. It became a critical kind of attractor where everybody had to that everybody had to go around in order to go either east of India or west of India. Um, so now, since then, um, the migrations have been mostly coastal, and the islands became interesting where people wanted to have shortcuts to some destinations, but also they became interested as uh, what the way stations for fresh water because that was critical for long distance navigation. Um, and before that, the uh, people that really had navigated very far before Europeans got all the credit, the Polynesians had done it from Polynesia to Madagascar and from Polynesia to uh, Hawaii. Uh, and these are the, the, the very first long distance seafarers. The Chinese had done it, but just along the coast. And the, the Arabs had done it also along the coast. Uh, now, if we are interested in decolonizing the knowledge about the sea, although we can learn from sea mammals, wouldn't it be a priority to learn from the islanders? Uh, what the traditional knowledge of interactions with the sea must have been like, because these are probably people that to rely very much on migration from one island to another. That's my question. So, absolutely. I mean, in short, 
uh, recovering histories, not just of the islanders though, because even these other groups that you're talking about, I mean, there was a very recent discovery of what everyone is, seems to think is an East African Tao in China, mm -hmm. um, still being dated. So this maritime archeology span in the service of decolonizing histories of maritime exploration as well and long distance travel um, is, is kind of a, a really live area of research. And it's partly because maritime archeology span firstly wasn't looking necessarily for the right things, but also is developing techniques all the time very expensive obviously to do um we ran a conference on maritime archaeology um on the island of mozambique which is a kind of entrepot for for trade um over quite a long period of time you know we think of it as kind of a center of mozambican trade but uh archaeology on the island is revealing you know chinese coins coins from the far distant interior of africa that are being traded um with areas like china and india much uh, longer ago than we thought. Um, Kilwa coins from, from East Africa were uh, discovered about two years ago on the coast of north coast of Australia. Still trying to figure out, I think people are trying to figure out how they um, got there. So there they might be, I think, a future of a much um, enriched history of maritime exploration is not completely dominated by the Europeans. Um, uh, um, explorers and I, I don't know the extent to which that will you know become a sort of um, an equal history but it's it's definitely worth um, you know it's it, this is the kind of stuff that we're waiting on tender hooks for for the scholarly publications about um, uh, so 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 yes and but also um, things like the Pacific Islanders that, that those histories of, of navigation I mean this is you know, few, quite a few um, exhibitions about this, about using stories and um, these stick maps to navigate, because the, the, there's a, a large amount of work, if you think about the uh, maritime museums of Greenwich in England, etc. It's a huge amount of work on the histories of, of developing technologies for navigation that allowed for these very long distance travel, for instance, uh, figuring out the problem of longitude, but there's very little knowledge in comparison um, and, and in, insufficient research about um, uh, alternative styles of, of navigation. I've worked a bit on kind of um, uh, more speculative short stories, for instance, about um, uh, uh, Indian navigation, exploring the Southern Ocean. Um, but but they, I, I think that if a little bit more concerted work on in these fields will, I think, as usual, reveal that there was more active involvement than has been than we've been led to believe. Um, yeah. So that was uh, the question about um, recovering um, certainly African, Arab, Chinese um, histories of of early exploration by ship across long distances. Um, who was the, oh, there's a, a fantastic, um, I think this is in one of the Goerner books, novels, um, but this, uh, you know, it, it's this kind of short little potted history in the middle of a fiction, but it's about how the Chinese did come to East Africa, you know, Chinese explorers came to East Africa and they just, yeah. you know, didn't feel like they should colonize it, so they went back, and then that that kind of the history of those early exploring gets lost um, uh, yeah. for actually good rather than bad reasons. Um, but but that's much more. I you know that's my area is to is to look at the stories about these things rather than find out the the history itself. Which um, so I have to look, leave that to the historians. Yeah. And to just deal quickly with McConney's question, um, yes, if you pay attention to the sea, um, which is has one major difference from land, which in its, is in its three dimensionality. So it's volumetric. Um, it requires you to think volumetrically, um, unlike land, in which we're always, you know, stuck by gravity onto onto a, a much more one dimension, two dimensional surface. Um, uh, it does lead you to think about the other volumetric space with which we are surrounded, which is the air. And there's a bit of work being done in that area now. Sarah Nassel, who spoke to you two weeks ago, mm. is working on um, a kind of linking air to sea, to land by, um, or Isabel Hoffman started this, Sarah Nassel's working on rain as one of the aspects of, that links these three things together by the um, hydrological cycle. Um, and, and a lot of the work in kind of volumetric studies in general links um, water to 
to air as, as, as the two. Um, there's work, uh, work being done on atmospheres um, and there is a certain fluidity that is a part of these things that you can't, um, uh, uh, A.L. Wiseman just gave a talk at, at Wiser on this point. He's working on, on uh, uh, studies of clouds, the ways in which um, dust clouds, poison clouds um, can circulate across geographies in ways that um, we probably don't have quite enough of a grip on because we aren't mm. thinking, we, our, our thinking is very land-based. So yes, there is work being done on atmosphere studies and air just as much as sea. Thank you very much. Um, Edwin, do you want to move us to the after party? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought Sally Coco was wanted to ask a follow-up question, but if no, yeah. Yeah, well, actually, I was going to just underscore something that comes from uh, um, Chan's uh, presentation is the uh, directions of the monsoon winds. Uh, because the year was really split into two parts, one, th one part for sailing east and another part for sailing west. Because doing it the other way as ships depended on uh, the direction of the wind would have been catastrophic, and especially with the violent monsoon uh, 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 season uh, winds, uh, there were a lot of wreckage that people uh, don't talk about. Uh, I read a, a story somewhere talking about the East Indian companies, how uh, uh, one particular expedition left Europe with 23 ships, but when it returned, it was only about 12 to 13 ships. Everything else had been lost. And the, the only reason why they uh, continued the expeditions is that they were making, the companies were making so much profit that it was affordable to rebuild build new ships and so forth and go again. But what the other thing that comes from this is the, the extent of idling time in one part of the world. So for instance, when Europeans arrive in Asia, uh, in some places like uh, Guangzhou, they could wait for up to six months until it, the wind's more favorable to sailing back. And question is how much um, epistemic change took place during these idling times. Uh, we don't hear very much about that. And I, I work on fields and fictions and we speculate a lot about the kinds of things that could have happened. Uh, like when people needed rules, people needed women, people needed some other kind of entertainment and so forth. And people were really changing a lot of things. But what is particularly relevant to uh, the monsoon winds is that as much credit that the Europeans got in exploring the world from Europe all the way to Japan, a lot of that knowledge for navigation was learned from Arabs and the Chinese who had been trading in that part of the world before the Europeans ever did. So it was not just a matter of technological, um, the, the evolution of technology, it was also a knowledge, a, a matter of learning from people that had had more experience and capitalizing on that experience in order to do better. That, that's just what I wanted to add. I could not have said that better myself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Um, so I'll now hand over to Kim, who would give us more information about the speaker for next weekend.